Okay, let's talk about child maltreatment. Child maltreatment is a willful injury by one person um, to another. And not only does it place a child at immediate risk for harm, but it can have long-term effects as well. There's very di different types of abuse. There's child, uh, or I should say physical abuse. There's physical neglect, psychological or emotional abuse. There's sexual abuse. Um, there's Munchausen syndrome by proxy. Uh, those are just to name a few, but we're going to go through them here in a little bit. There's different theories to child maltreatment, um, and there's what they call a special triad of triad of circumstances, which is the special parent, special child, and special circumstance, which we're going to go through in the next slide. Um, but some classic red flags of child or of non-accidental trauma would be spiral fractures from a twisting force. You don't just get those easily. Usually the most common times you get a spiral fracture either from uh, an MVA or from maybe a sports injury, but there has to be a significant amount of twisting force to create a spiral fracture. Skull fractures. Skull fractures aren't normal in any child, um, not just a particular age, but if we're wearing sports equipment, we're riding where we need to be riding in the back seat of a car, or we're properly restrained, we shouldn't be getting spiral fracture, or not spiral, but immense uh, skull fractures very easily. And any fracture in a non-mobile infant is always suspicious, especially in the long bones. If they're not mon if they're not mobile, how did the infant get it in the first place? Something had to happen. And either they weren't supervised and they fell, or somebody has created um, a striking force on the infant or to the infant um, to create a fracture. Um, and in, the other important thing is to always make sure you're assessing for those injuries that don't match the child's developmental age or their ability to, to do something. Um, and are those injuries out of proportion to the explanation that's given? Um, and matching stories. Again, is it, you know, not only just what does the child tell you if they're old enough to tell you what happened, what does the parent tell you or both parents tell you um, whenever you're interviewing a child? about their injuries. So in the previous slide I mentioned that there's a special um, triad of circumstances. There's usually the special parent, which is the parent who maltreats. And sometimes there's a small fraction of those who have a, the parent has a history of a mental illness. Um, it could be maybe they were maltreated as a child. They're just unfamiliar with growth and development, which is why it's so important to make sure they, that we're always teaching them um, in any opportunity, but especially during those well-child visits, what is normal growth and development? Because oftentimes when they have unex unexpected or unrealistic expectations um, of what their child can do, it can certainly lead to cases of abuse. Um, also, maybe this parent, the special parent, is socially isolated. They don't have a support system around them, um, and it becomes very overwhelming with child care. Um, and there's also a strongly associated um, use of parental drugs, alcohol. Any of those things, alcohol, drugs, those remove the inhibitions and self-control that the parent would normally have, which makes it um, a little more likely that they could abuse a child. The second triad, special child. This is the child or ch children who are maltreated. They are somehow viewed by the parents as different, as somehow different. That means they could be more or less intelligent than the other children in the family. Maybe they weren't planned. Uh, maybe they're not living up to whatever the parents' expectations are. There's a birth anomaly present. Maybe they have ADHD um, and they have the attention, the hyperactivity attention deficit disorder. Um, and then, of course, we also know with there are high-risk um, children, especially those who are premature, um, where illness separated them at birth and they never really got um, the strong bonding. And because the child is, anyhow, either way, whatever the risk is as to why the child is seen as special, uh, that child is somehow perceived as different. And when they're perceived as different, there's usually never a strong parent-child relationship that develops. And without that, obviously think back to your theories, trust versus mistrust. 
Um, so without an effective relationship, the child is injured. Parents are unable to deal with the stress um, and maybe not show the usual degree of compassion for their child's pain or offer co comfort, support. Um, maybe the parent appears more concerned about how the injury affects them than how it affects the child. They may not seek treatment for an injury in the expected amount of time that we would um, typically think of. And ways to prevent child mal or maltreatment of a child, always assume a role reversal, or not always assume, I should say, assume a role reversal with the parent or they're becoming um, the comforter, the child is, in order to comfort the parent, to keep them um, not as stressed, so inevitably, so they're not, the child's not getting abused. Um, as well as we also see the child learns to comfort the parent to reduce their stress, their anxiety. Um, the parent may, or the, not the parent, but the child may become more of the parent role than, than the child role. And it's always important to assess in these situations who is comforting who. That can tell us a lot. Our observations in general can tell us a lot. But it's important to see who's comforting who. In some cases, again, it's more the child is doing the comforting because they know that as a way to reduce the parent's stress or anxiety about whatever is going on and in turn may reduce the chances of the child being abused themselves. And the last one, special circumstance or stress. Um, this is when there's a, um, the response to an event wouldn't, that wouldn't normally be stressful causes um, an undue amount of stress for the parent compared to the average. So that could be blocked toilet training, illness in a family, lost job, um, unable to pay their rent or their bills, and it creates panic for them, um, a lot of stress. This can cross all socioeconomic levels, um, but generally has a greater impact on the individuals who do not have a strong support system around them leads to that higher incidence of maltreatment. Okay. Reporting suspected child maltreatment. Nurses must report suspected child maltreatment when they identify it. Failure to do so or report that suspicion could result in a fine, jail time, or even loss of a nursing licensure. Um, information that is given in a confidential interview does not free the nurse from responsibility. There's an exemption under HIPAA. And it's important to make sure you know and learn wherever it is you're working what your institution's policy are or is on reporting um, mal, you know, suspected maltreatment. Um, and by state laws, um, there's protection from having a lawsuit against, brought against a healthcare provider for reporting suspected maltreatment because we're doing it in good faith. So it's always better to kind of err on the side of caution when you're reporting it. Um, and parents need to be told as well that um, we suspect that there is child maltreatment that we are going to investigate um, to make sure that the child is safe. Um, so it's important to have those open lines of communication with the parent and the child um, and so that they know and, and of course doing it in a non-accusatory fashion. Um, when you're taking that history, um, maltreatment's not always done by the parent or the significant caregiver in the home. Um, there could be alternate caregivers that are at fault. That could be daycare workers, babysitters, um, the spouse, or I shouldn't say the spouse, but the parents, um, significant other, a new spouse, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, um, another relative in the family. There's various um, people that it could be, but don't always assume it's the parent. All right, the first type of abuse or maltreatment we're going to talk about is physical maltreatment. And that is the action of the caregiver causes physical harm to the child. Um, it's commonly revealed by burns or injuries to the head or the hands, but there can be all kinds of things. Um, bruises, human bite marks, um, rope burns from being tied up around the wrist or the ankles, um, burns, scalding burns from hot liquid or hot water, being immersed in hot water. Um, so look at that um, little pictorial that I have not only on this slide but also in your notes, same one. Um, just gives you some various different ideas of what physical maltreatment could look like. Um, but when you're taking your health history, 
You want to always account, ask the caregiver to account for any injuries to the child's bodies. Body, I should say, not bodies, body. Most childhood injuries are a result of unintentional injuries that are caused by the child's inability to distinguish safe situations from dangerous ones, parent overestimating their child's ability. And really what we're looking for is, is the injury out of proportion to the history given? So always asking parents, um, both parents, if they're present, about what happened. If the child is old enough, ask them what happened and explain how their injuries occurred. Because what we're doing is we're looking for conflicting stories or if no reason is given for the injury that's suspicious. And again, with the child, we want to ask them as well to account because we're looking for any sort of inconsistencies in the various stories that are given to us. We do want to remain subjective about our observations and looking at how much does the, the child cry in response to painful procedures. Oftentimes there's very little crying when they, like an injection or an IV start um, when we're doing a painful procedure, which is not normal for most kids, they would. Um, are they drawing back from the examiner more than the average child because they're afraid of adults? So there's lots of things we can observe um, to certainly support um, the suspicion of abuse. But we always want to remain objective. Assume that the parent has done the best that they could under the circumstances that they found themselves in. Maybe they're being abused themselves. This could be the way that they're asking for help. The fact that they've brought the child in for care um, could be their way of trying to seek out help without verbally saying that. So again, always assume that they're doing the best that they can in the circumstances that they're in. In many instances, child maltreatment is not an isolated phenomenon where the parent um, is a victim and needs just as much help and protection as the child. During physical examination, um, this is why during those well-child visits or even illness visits, it's always important to examine the child when they're fully undressed so we can observe the entire body um, and get a good skin assessment because a lot of things can be hidden by clothing. So it's, that's always important to make sure you um, have them fully undress and put on a gown that we can easily observe their full body. We always want to plot their height and weight on the standard growth chart because that can certainly show us delays in their growth that might point more to neglect, not getting enough nutrition. Um, some other examples, um, bruising, welts, lacerations, burns or skull burns, cigarette burns, fractures, bite marks, um, various types of fractures, um, and looking at are these fractures healing, or are they brand new, or are they old, um, can certainly tell us if there's been a history. Um, and the last little piece, too, about thinking about bruises and filling in those blanks, um, bruises on a child who's too young to walk are always highly suspicious. So we call that the three Bs. Bruises on babies are nearly always bad. Bruises on babies are always nearly bad. Those are certainly things... If they're not mobile, they're not walking, how did they get these bruises? It's important to look too, where are the bruises occurring? What if you have a toddler? Where would you expect to see bruises? Typically you'd expect to see those on their shins, their knees, um, because oftentimes they, when they're running, they fall, they're still kind of clumsy. But if you're seeing them on the back, the rib cage, somewhere else that you wouldn't typically expect to see them, something else might be going on that we would need to investigate further. Shaken baby syndrome um, is often a result of the frustration of the caregiver with the baby's crying, uh, which leads to violently shaking the infant or young child by the arms or shoulders. And what that does is it ends up causing a whiplash injury to the neck, which will result in edema to the brainstem and possibly even a subdural hemorrhage. And it can lead to also very what's called very distinctive hemorrhages to the retinas as well. It's a little harder to um, prove because the damage that is inflicted is not readily apparent um, unless they've been brought in because their behavior has changed and we start doing other tests. Um, we can't always see all these things because they're more internal. They're not as um, physically apparent as you would typically see with like physical maltreatment. Physical neglect. Um, this is where a child may appear um, unwashed, thin, malnourished, 
or you know dressed inappropriately for the weather that's outside especially thinking about um, in times of when it starts to get cold or is really cold you know are they wearing shorts and a t-shirt not wearing a proper you know winter coat um, this certainly can suggest maybe possibly some neglect other signs of neglect um, and I'm not here to argue all of these points, but failing to bring a child in for immunizations. That's why it's so important if somebody does not want, um, you know, say they do bring their child in, but they don't want immunizations to certainly document that why they're refusing and that we've done the education. But just failure to not bring a child in, period, um, can certainly be um, considered physical neglect. Um, failing to seek early medical care for infections or are... Um, other signs of neglect not requiring a child to go to school because if you're going to keep a kid um, out of school or they you know want to you want to do homeschooling whatever the case may be if, if they're not going to a public or private school then we have to provide not we but the parent has to provide alternative means of education either homeschooling um, some sort of online program something um, to be able to make sure they're getting the education that they need Allowing a child to go unsupervised after school can be considered neglect. Of course, I think some of that depends on the age of your child. Obviously, a young child coming home um, in elementary school, I'm talking like kindergarten, first grade, and or you leave the you know parent leaves the house and leaves a young child in charge or by themselves, is not appropriate. When is the right time to let a child stay home by themselves? Well. There's no set number. I think that depends on the family, depends on the child, um, as to when an appropriate time is. But definitely going unsupervised after school can be considered neglect because we know that kids get into, um, you know, things in the house or get into trouble because of lack of supervision. Also part of physical neglect, um, the unwill, mean unwilling, um, or, or I should say, uh, may be willful or because parents don't realize the normal needs of the child. Again, it's important to make sure we're keeping them um, well educated on what are expected um, growth and development for their child. That's why we always are reviewing those. That's why it's so important to have a basic understanding of what normal growth and development looks like so we can educate the parents on what their child's needs are. Psychological maltreatment. That includes the constant belittling or threatening, rejecting, isolating, or exploiting a, cho a child. Um, there's an absence of positive parenting. And the children are, are likely to have difficulty becoming emotionally confident adults because they've constantly been put down their life, their entire life. Um, it is the most difficult form of maltreatment to prove um, because, again, there's no physical signs. There's nothing um, outwardly showing um, that something has happened to them. Um, it's important to again to include in your growth and development questions about health and during the health assessment to reveal this um, and making sure we ask the right kind of questions. And again, observation is powerful. Observing that parent-child interaction determine is it positive or negative. You would think parents would be on their best behavior in front of healthcare workers, whether at a physician's office, in the hospital, whatever their encounter may be. Um, but surprisingly, um, people sometimes forget where they're at. And you can observe a lot in the, just the way that they talk to their child and interact. Is it positive or negative? Munchausen syndrome by proxy is when a parent reportedly brings the child to a healthcare facility and reports symptoms of illness when the child is in fact well there's nothing wrong with them um, and sometimes they will even the or not even but sometimes or at least in the beginning they will the caregiver fabricates what these signs and symptoms are of the illness which is the by pro, the proxy part and then they do this in order to gain attention from the medical staff unfortunately though it puts the child undergoing painful um, procedures and treatments that aren't even really needed and sometimes they just report these symptoms and and then other times as things progress or they're not finding anything when they do these tests but the parent keeps saying oh but they're having these symptoms um, sometimes they will even the parent will even resort to making the child physically ill 
Um, but there are two classic findings of the syndrome that are usually present. The symptoms are not easily detected by a physical exam, only by the history, only by the history given by the parent. Or uh, the second one being symptoms are present only when the person initiating the symptoms is providing care. Someone else comes in, provides care, those symptoms disappear. Uh, the parent usually has some sort of degree of medical or child care knowledge that's obtained either through formal education, reading, internet browsing, that gives them a little bit of knowledge um, in order to fabricate these symptoms. Um, in the hospital, oftentimes parents will tend to stay with the child constantly. They don't want to leave their side because they know if they leave their side, the child won't have the symptoms that they're reporting. Um, so they're, they're giving the majority of the care because, again, they don't want to leave that child alone. In order to diagnose this, we usually have to do some covert video surveillance um, in order to catch them, um, especially if they are giving the child something to make them physically ill. And almost always is it necessary to remove that child from the home in order to protect the child, but as well, any child who's being abused in any situation, um, when you remove one child, if there are other child's in, children in the home, they all need to be removed because when you remove the child who is being abused, oftentimes the parent will then turn their attention towards other children if you don't remove them. But in all cases, or in this particular case, or in really any case, the parent has very distorted perceptions. So that again, that's why it's so important to remove the child from the home in order to protect them. All right, and the last form of child maltreatment we're gonna talk about is failure to thrive or FTT. Um, your book puts it in the child maltreatment chapter. However, I don't see it as, as that black and white because um, failure to thrive can be caused as, as a lot basically as a form of abuse or neglect, but it can also be due to other issues. So I left it in this chapter because that's where the book talks about it, but we're going to talk about some other issues that can also um, result in failure to thrive. But failure to thrive is a sign of inadequate growth that results from an inability to obtain or use the calories required for growth. So oftentimes infants, and really it, could, it doesn't have to just be an infant, I've seen teenagers, I've seen school age kids who are failure to fi fi thrive, um, but any child who fails to grow and gain weight normally, and especially as an infant, meet those developmental milestones are classified as failure to thrive. So usually they're less than fifth percentile on those growth charts. There are two main categories, and that's organic and non-organic. Yes, I know I have a third one listed there, which is idiopathic. Um, but organic failure to thrive is usually a result of there's some, or, some sort of other disease process going on. There's a cardiac um, anomaly or disease, the metabolic disorder, cystic fibrosis, celiac disease, where either we're, we're burning through our calories too, too fast or we're not absorbing because of cystic fibrosis, celiac disease that are affecting the way that we absorb the nutrients for growth. And then there's non-organic, organic failure to thrive, which is disturbance of the parent-child relationship, often resulting in a maternal role insufficiency, and it is considered a form of child neglect. And then the last one I talked about is idiopathic, which is not that common. Um, it usually falls in either organic or non-organic, but idiopathic is a disease of exclu or diagnosis of exclusion, and it can only be used as a diagnosis after the patient has been carefully evaluated for both organic and non-organic um, failure to thrive. So causes of failure to thrive. The primary etiology is decreased caloric intake, regardless of the cause. Um, this can often be multifactorial. It can be involved in a combination of, again, organic diseases, dysfunctional parenting, subtle neurologic or behavioral problems, or there's a disturbed parent-child interaction. You can see the other factors there as well that can certainly can contribute to it. We can have attachment issues, um, and you can see those listed as well. So how do we diagnose failure to thrive? Well, when we're diagnosing it, first we need to get a dietary history. And of course, we're gonna look at prenatal history. Is there any causes that would um, certainly 
lead to failure to thrive. We'll do a thorough physical exam. And of course, we need to weigh the child, plot those growth chart measurements um, so that we can detect this earlier, sooner, rather sooner than later. Um, and of course, we're going to do a family assessment. We're looking for any of those dysfunctional parenting behaviors or disturbed parent-child interaction. And we need to rule out all physical causes first. Um, and the baby could dramatically improve while in the hospital under different caregivers. So again, that's just a demonstrating if there's some dysfunctional parenting behaviors going on. Um, symptoms. They can have lethargy with poor muscle tone, a loss of subcutaneous fat or skin breakdown, because if they're not getting it enough, the body is going to steal it from somewhere else, right? Um, so oftentimes they are very skinny and have the, you know, like in the picture I have on the screen, um, just very emancipated, just there's just no muscle mass whatsoever. Um, they often have a lack of resistance to the examiner's manipulation, unlike the typical response you'd see in an average infant or child. Um, possibly a greater reluctance to reach for toys or initiate human contact. Um, if they're not accustomed to being uh, somebody interacting with them, they don't know what that's like. Maybe they have a diminished or non-existent cry. They might stare hungrily at people um, as like they're starved for human contact. They often have little cuddling or conforming to being held. And they will have delays in sitting and pulling to a standing position, crawling, walking, um, because oftentimes they've spent so much time alone. And again, it's the lack of meeting those developmental milestones. If we don't have the nutrition that we need, it's going to affect our development. And they often have um, delayed or absent speech because of the lack of interaction that has occurred. Our therapeutic management for a child who has failure to thrive. Um, any child with failure to thrive needs to be removed from the parent's care for evaluation and therapy. Um, and maybe that just means either completely removed from the child, or not the child, I'm sorry, from the parent's care, or it could mean um, hospitalize them so that they're under supervision by um, hospital staff. Um, sometimes in more severe cases, or if this has been a long-term issue, um, they will admit them into the hospital because they also want to see, are they going to improve under the care of someone else? And especially in, if there is evidence of severe amount um, nutrition, or again, we're suspecting child abuse or neglect, they will hospitalize them. But our nutritional um, management, our whole goals is we want to correct any of those nutritional deficiencies and achieve ideal weight for their height. We need to allow for catch-up growth, restore their optimum body composition, and do lots of education with the parent or caregiver regarding what the child's nutritional requirements are and, of course, appropriate feeding methods, and especially if they have a lack of knowledge about what is needed um, for the child or what nutrition is needed, how to support that um, we can do a lot of education around those pieces. Our treatment, the nursing um, role is critical. It provides and fosters a nurturing environment to help the baby begin to grow. And we want to have, um, f and I should say, consistent caregivers um, in order to achieve that. So support the caregiver as well in the effort to cope with whatever their problems are. Are. Often they may need some counseling to help develop good coping skills. And a lot of it too is aimed at behavior modifications, especially at meal times, because if they never had good mealtime rituals, there's a lack of those. And um, maybe the uh, family social side of things, um, that might be required. They need to learn how to do that. If they've never had set meal times and what a meal ritual looks like, um, then they not only does the parent need to learn that, or the caregiver, but also the, the child. Um, and we want to teach good parenting skills. So encourage the holding, cuddling with the baby so we have that strong parent-child interaction. And of course, touching can be very critical. Um, so 
other things to think about is, um, again, those feeding and behavior modifications that we need to do. So one of the big ones, if they're hospitalized, provide a primary core of staff to feed the child to the best of our abilities. Um, as If we can have consistent nurses or PCAs who are working with that child, um, that can be helpful because that's going to help build that trust. Uh, we want to provide a quiet, unstimulating atmosphere. That doesn't mean you don't talk to the infant or the child. You still have to talk to them. It's just talking about get rid of all the background noises, all the distractions. If the TV's on, turn it off. Get the toys away you know, from wherever they're having their meal. It shouldn't be, that should not be what it's focused on. Um, Again, side conversations, if there's caregiver in the room or other children, or not other children, other people in the room, those conversations need to stop so that the focus is on the meal time that the child needs to learn. Maintain a calm, even temperament throughout the meal. Again, if the child has not had a customary meal time where they actually sit in a high chair or at a table with a plate of food in front of them, um, they have to learn how to do that. Um, and making sure that, too, we're teaching the parent not to become frustrated with the child um, because this is going to take some time, so a calm, even temperament throughout the meal. We do want to develop a structured routine, meaning we're having consistency, that, um, you know, we sit in the high chair or we sit at the table for a meal. You know, we might start out with maybe the meal is going to be, you know, they've got 45 minutes to eat it, and then we work down to the half hour. But the meal shouldn't go on forever. Um, and again, the, it's, we're developing the structure and we're being consistent with it. We need to be persistent. Um, it needs to, it can be certainly something that it takes some time for the child to learn, and maybe even the parent. We want to maintain a face-to-face -face posture, interaction. Introduce new food slowly. If they've never been exposed to it, um, again, this is going to take some time, depending on the age of the child, to work with them to introduce new foods. And you got to follow the child's rhythm of feeding. You can't just shovel it in and expect them to eat it really quickly. Um, if they, again, aren't accustomed to that, um, that is something they need to learn. And an older child, it's important to still talk to them. Like I said, um, it's not about being completely quiet. It's about getting rid of the, the background and the other distractions. But you still need to talk to the child and encouraging them. You're doing a good job. Take a bite. Um, those kind of things. Or, or try this. Um, and being really encouraging. Providing that nurturing environment. All right. Sexual maltreatment is defined as any sexual contact between a child and an adult. Um, it usually involves the coercion of a dependent. Um, developmentally immature children or adolescents in sexual activities. This will leave a child physically and emotionally destructed. Um, it leaves the child unable to trust others. It re can result in a sense of ambivalence towards intimacy and, over and an overall sense of worthlessness. So it is important to remind parents to teach children, especially by preschool age, that their bodies are their own. What is good touch versus bad touch? Who is it okay, you know, to be, not that it's in, okay for anyone to be touching them, but it's okay for a parent to be helping a child when they're bathing and to have to touch them in their private, er private areas. As well as, you know, when, you know, you go for these well-child exams and the physician is, um, uh, examining the child that it mommy and daddy or mommy and daddy whoever the caregiver is is giving permission with them there to assess the child um, and telling of course what the what it is they're going to do but it is important to make sure that especially by preschool age they know um, that their bodies are their own and like I said, what is good touch and bad touch? And if anything makes them or anyone makes them feel uncomfortable or tries to touch them in a way they do not like, to make sure they report it to an adult, um, their parent, um, or, or a trusted adult um, so that it can uh, be investigated. And children who've been sexually maltreated, they often have a sexual vocabulary well beyond their expected age. On a physical exam, Girls will typically have tears or inflammation of the vagina or the perineum. And both sexes can have rectal tears or symptoms of sexually transmitted diseases. 
And then um, what Megan's Law is, and a lot of people, it, it depends on how many people know about this. I'm always surprised at how few people or how few students actually are familiar with Megan's Law. Megan's Law is a federal law that requires law enforcement authorities to report to neighbors when a sexual abuser has moved into a neighborhood. Um, parents need to be aware about this law and insist that it be enforced so that they can pr help protect their child's safety. Um, sexual predators are listed on an internet website and can be tracked by, by parents. Um, you can go Google it, put in your zip code or your address, and it is amazing how many little dots on your screen will appear, and those are any sexual predators or anyone who's been labeled as a sexual predator um, so that you are aware as to what the, how close they are vicinity that they live to you. Um, but again, how well is it enforced? Well, I think that depends on where you live. Um, but it is important to definitely know about. And parents need to be aware as well about child pornography laws. In this day and age of our technology and kids younger and younger having cell phones and social media accounts, um, this is certainly something to, to think about. Because any time that an um, underage child, we hear all the time about sexting. Um, and with sexting, with friends, they think it's only being shared with one person um, and that it's safe and they won't forward it on. Unfortunately, we know we've heard plenty of cases where it gets shared. Um, but the problem is, is even sexting something that they may think is fairly innocent um, can violate Megan's Law. Even though they're a minor doing the texting, they can be labeled a sexual predator. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of times once you're labeled as a sexual predator, that's kind of for lifetime. It's very hard to get rid of. So again, children can be forever classified as a sexual abuser under Megan's Law. So it's important to teach kids with the technology that we do have about the importance and the safeguards that they need to put in place, not only to protect themselves, um, but also not to put themselves at, at that risk either. Uh, characteristics of an abuser? Typically, the abuser is male. They seem trustworthy. So coaches, teachers, um, someone inside the family, a sibling, another parent, a step-parent. Um, it could be somebody that they contact through chat rooms. Yes, those still exist um, that they do online. And there's various types of sexual maltreatment. You can I'm not going to go through those, but you can read through the different types of sexual maltreatment as well. So assessment of sexual maltreatment, I highly encourage you to go look at that box that I've referred you to in the notes on signs of sexual maltreatment, but um, that'll give you more detail. A few of them, anytime to, uh, to be suspicious of sexual maltreatment, a young girl who's worrying she is pregnant, um, you know, something had to happen as to why she is re worrying that she's pregnant. Um, child's abnormal anxiety about a parent returning home from a hospital stay or from traveling um, could certainly be signs. Being left with or cared for by a particular individual in the family. Um, there's a lot of, if there's a lot of anxiety around um, having to stay with this person, um, certainly something to be suspicious about. Um, young children who are victims typically have extremely low self-esteem and many believe that they're inadequate and they deserve to be treated this way. Um, it's important to allow especially young children to play with anatomically correct dolls. Um, and this is a common method that they will use to determine if sexual maltreatment has occurred because children will, especially young children, if they can't really talk or describe, they'll take the dolls and actually, actually act out what has occurred to them. Um, it's also something else you could do is ask a child to draw a picture of what has happened. Um, and explain that picture to them. It will often reveal sexual maltreatment in that picture as well. Therapeutic management, um, no matter what, it must be reported because it is a criminal offense and that is our job as nurses to suspect if there's any suspicion of child maltreatment, we need to report that. And any information about maltreatment, it needs to be collected objectively so that the adults 
rights are respected and testimony is also admissible into the court. Um, and both the adult and the child who are involved in the um, sexual maltreatment are going to need psychological counseling. The child is to improve their self-esteem. Um, for the adult, it's for them to channel their sexual expression in a less destructive way. And parents who are not involved in the sexual maltreatment um, may need just as much counseling as the child. Um, that's also so that they can help their child work through the feelings that they're having about the situation to help the parent work through their feelings of guilt if they have any. And they often do. And then, of course, we need to treat for any sexually transmitted infections and protection against pregnancy should be provided as well if that is uh, something that is of concern or is found due to the sexual maltreatment.